don't trust any of this equipment. All right, so uh, we've said what a natural transformation is, and now we can, before, um, when we did functors, uh, I said that now we, you can infer from that what a notion of isomorphism between categories was, but I wouldn't tell you what that meant because it was a bad notion. Um, now we're going to talk about the good notion, which we can do now that we have natural transformations. So uh, an equivalence of categories um, is, so what do we have? We have a pair of functors, f from c to d, and g from d to c. Uh, together with, all right, and now, so I'm specifying um, natural transformations, or sorry, natural isomorphisms, eta from the identity on C to uh, G composed with F and epsilon from F composed of G to the identity on D. All right. Uh, so I want to note that like an equivalence of categories is not just this pair of functors. It's this pair of functors and specified natural isomorphisms between them. Um, so you might have an equivalence of category. You might have two equivalences of categories that have the same functors, but you might use different isomorphisms between them. And so they're different equivalent. They're different things recognizing the equivalence of those categories. All right. Uh, we say that uh, C and D are equivalent if such a, such a collection of information exists. Uh, and we write C. Uh, the, we write it like this. So it's like the isomorphism symbol, but with one less line. Um, all right. So that's the definition of equivalence of categories. Um, I think we won't see one just yet, because we're going to see a theorem um, that a sort of recognition theorem that tells you when a functor is an equivalence, is part of an equivalence of categories. Um, and means you don't need to specify all this information. You just say something about one of the functors, and then all this information exists somewhere. Um, so like I said, equivalence is all this information, but somehow you don't necessarily like care about the specific presentation of that information. Like you only care that they're equivalent, and that if required, you could construct such an equivalence. Um, all right. So uh, a functor, functor, from C to D is, OK, now we're just doing some definitions. It's full if the function uh, So recall that a functor gives us a function of this form for any pair of objects x and y and c uh, is subjective for all x and y and c. OK, so that's what full means. Um, now, we say that a, a subcategory is full if you specify the objects, and then the morphisms between any two objects in the subcategory is all of the morphisms between those two objects in the, full in the larger category. Uh, and so, so people usually take that as the definition of a full subcategory. But um, really, what you should say is that a full subcategory is a subcategory such that the inclusion functor is full. That's why. That's how this definition lines up with what people would usually use to say a full subcategory. 
All right. So for example, the subcategory of abelian groups in the category of groups is full because every group homomorphism between abelian groups is still a group. Like every group homomorphism between two abelian groups, forgetting that they're abelian, is still a group homomorphism between abelian groups when you remember that they're abelian. Um, uh, faithful, so a functor is faithful uh, if the function, if, all right, so it's, if this function from cy d fx fy is injective for all x and y and c. Um, and together, we would call these two conditions uh, being fully faithful. So people will write fully faithful to mean that a function is both full and faithful. And the last thing that we need is a function is essentially, essentially subject, uh, uh, subjective on objects. So that's a bit of a mouthful. If for all um, objects y in the target category D, there exists um, an object x in the source category such that uh, the image of f is isomorphic to y. So for every, every object in the target category, we can find something here that maps to something that's isomorphic to that object. Um, OK, so that's, I'm going to switch cameras. All right. And now we're going to do a fairly uh, long proof. So we have this theorem that I was talking about. It's this recognition theorem. Um, a functor f from c to d is part of Equivalence of categories uh, if and only if it is fully faithful, faithful and subjective on objects. Ah, uh, yes, essentially. Thank you. Essentially. All right. Great. So I should say that if you have an equivalence of categories, then it is fully faithful and essentially subjective. And if you assume the axiom of choice, then given a functor that is fully faithful and essentially subjective, it is an equivalence of categories, or is part of an equivalence of categories. So we do need the equivalence of uh, the, the axiom of choice for one of these directions. All right. So let's get started. Um, so let's suppose that we have an equivalence of categories. So we have um, f c to d g. <coughs> um, we have uh, eta from uh, the identity on C to uh, G composed from F and epsilon from F composed of G to the identity on D. And suppose
summarize this is an equivalence of categories. All right. So um, the first thing to note is that using this, if we pick some, using, using the, uh, this part of the equivalence, if we pick some x in d, we have for x in d, the component map goes from f of g of x to x. And because this is a natural isomorphism, this is an isomorphism. Uh, so uh, uh, f is essentially surjective on objects. Because we just take this object in D, we pass it via G to C and then back via F. And then F of G of X is isomorphic to X. So there's something in, um, in C. G of X in C satisfies the required condition. All right. So now, if uh, F of F is equal to f of g. So this is for two maps in C uh, for f and g from x to y in C. Uh, then, OK, we have this diagram. So for f, we have this diagram, x to g f of x, y to g f of y. And we have the components of eta, so eta x and eta y. And we have f here. And uh, uh, g f of f. g f of f. And this diagram commutes because this is uh, because eta is a natural transformation. And in fact, it's a natural isomorphism. So both of these components are isomorphisms. Um, <coughs> and you should note that if I replace um, f with g's, the little f's of g's, you get the same commutative square, right? Um, just with f uh, with g here and g f g here. So I have two commutative squares, one for f and one for g. Um, similar uh, square for g. All right, so f is equal to, OK, this square commutes. And I'm going to say that if you have a commutative diagram and you have isomorphisms in it, you can turn the isomorphism around. And it's still a commutative diagram. Um, that's something you can check. Um, so in fact, f is equal to a to x. So I can do a to x and then g of f of f and then the inverse um, morphism of eta of y, and that's equal to this. So I have eta y inverse. Um, and maybe I'll use composition symbols here, because there's a lot of things going on. g of f of f composed with eta x. However, we've said that f of f is equal to f of g, so this is a to y inverse of f of f g composed with a to f x. But this is, this is the description for the square where I've replaced these g's. So this thing is equal to g. So uh, f is faithful. Everyone happy with how I got to that? Just want to be. Everyone is going questions about that. Okay. <coughs> now, uh, and I want to say that similarly, similarly, and I'm not going to go through this carefully, but you can check that the diagram, the similar diagram, but using eta uh, epsilon. Sorry. Here, 
epsilon x, and here epsilon y. Uh, you can use the same argument, essentially, to show um, g is faithful. OK, great. So I've shown essentially subjective. I've shown faithful. Now all I need, to, and I'm only, I'm only really trying to show this for f, so I'm saying this for g because I'm going to need it. Um, and now all I need to show is that f is full, is a, is a full functor. All right. So given some h from fx to fy in d, so this is for x and y and c. Um, and now I just want to show that I can find some map in C from x to y, such that applying f to it gives you h. Uh, so we, we get a map, um, say f, which goes from x to g f of x. Uh, via a to x, then to g f of y by applying g to h. Right, so I've got a map from f of x to f of y, and I get a map from g of f of x to g of f of y by applying g to that map. And then I apply a to y inverse to get to y. All right. <coughs> So I've constructed this map f. Uh, then we have that, OK, now I can draw this, this one of these um, naturality squares again for eta. So g f of x, g f of y. Here I have this f that I constructed. And here I have g f of f. Uh, and here I have y, which is an isomorphism, and here I have eta x, which is an isomorphism. And this commutes by the naturality of eta. So uh, g f of f is equal to, OK, so now I'm doing the same thing, but I'm doing it for this one. I'm going this way. So I got a to y composed with f, composed with a to x inverse. Um, so commutative of the square means I can go this way. And it has to be the same as this map. Right, but I've defined f in this way as this composition of things. So this is a to y composed with a to y inverse composed with gh composed with a to x, composed with a to x inverse. Great. So I have some identities on either side. So I guess I should, if I'm using these composition symbols, I should be trying to be consistent. Um, so in fact, this is g of h. But, but g is faithful. Um, so f of f is equal to h. So f, uh, sorry, the functor f is full. OK, so f is fully faithful and essentially subjective. <coughs> so we've shown one direction, and now we want to show the other direction. And this is going to be some work. All right. Let's get started. So we did that way. Now we want to do this way. <coughs> OK, so what are we starting from? We're supposing that this functor f from c to d is fully faithful. And essentially subjective. 
All right. So, as as f is essentially subjective, and use now here is where we're using the axiom of choice. So this is where we use the axiom of choice. We can fix uh, an object g of x in C for each x in D. So firstly, um, I'm writing g of x here. G isn't a, func a functor yet. I'm building a functor in the other direction. But for now, g of x is just some object that corresponds to each x in D. Um, with a choice of isomorphism, uh, which we'll call epsilon x from f of gx to x. All right. So the fact that I can do this is the information of f being essentially subjective. Uh, and this is in d. All right. So given some map f from x to y in D, we can define um, a map f tilde, which goes from f g of x to x via epsilon x, and then goes to y via f, and then goes to f g of y by epsilon y inverse. Um, uh, as f is full, there exists um, a map, which I will call g of f, that goes from gx to gy in C <coughs> such that Applying the functor to this map, g of f, gets me f tilde. All right. So fullness means that there is some some map in C that hits this map f tilde. Um, and as f is faithful, <coughs> g f is unique. So in fact, there's only one such map between these two objects that hits this map. All right. Uh, so I could have just said, as f is fully faithful, there exists a unique map, but I wanted to, I wanted to split it up. All right, so note that um, uh, for the identity on g of x, from g of x to g of x, uh, we have that f applied to the identity on g of x has to be the identity on f of gx, um, just because f is a functor. Uh, and that IG, the identity idg of x tilde is OK, what is it? It goes from f g x to x to x to f g x, where this is epsilon <coughs> x. This is the identity on x. And this is, uh, wait, what have I done here? Oh, no, sorry. This is just the, this is the identity of x tilde. Sorry, not, g, not identity of g of x. 
Um, and this is epsilon x inverse. Uh, but this, but this is um, <coughs> the identity on fgx. Because this is the identity, so I can collapse that, and then these two are inverse. So it's the identity on f of gx. Um, so g of idx is id, right? So g of idx is, yeah, is idgx. Um, because, because f applied to idgx is this. Uh, and so because there's a unique such map with, with um, f applied to idgx equal to idx tilde, um, which is idfgx, then, then this functor that I am building G sends the identity to the identity as required. Um, all right. So similarly, uh, if we have x uh, f from x to y and g from y to z in D, then all right. What do I want to do? I want to show that f g of g composed with f g of f. What's this? This is the map f g x to x to y to f g y to y to f, g, z, no, to z, to z, to f, g, z, all right, uh, where this is a component, this is the inverse of a component, this is a component, this is the inverse of a component. So this is the identity. And this is f, and this is g. Well, f of uh, applied to g of g f is map from f g x to x to z, where this is g f to f of g z. And then if we just collapse this, this identity, these two maps are the same. Um, so, so gf tilde is g tilde composed with f tilde. So g of g uh, composed with g of f is g composed with f. Nope. G applied to F is G applied to G composed with F. So G is a functor. Hence, G is A. OK, so we've built some of our equivalents. Uh, we started with F. We've now built a G. Um, and in fact, we also uh, built an, an epsilon. So we should see that epsilon is a natural transformation, but it it follows that sort of the only thing that we were missing for this epsilon to be a natural transformation was uh, for g to be a functor. Um, it follows that epsilon x uh, from f g to the identity on D is a natural ISO. 
as okay, we have f g x, f g y, x y, uh, epsilon x, that's an isomorphism, epsilon y, that's an isomorphism. <coughs> this is f. All right. Uh, this is f tilde because that's how we defined f tilde. Um, but we also have this, which we wrote like this before because g wasn't a functor. But now that g is a functor, we know that this is just fg over f. Um, OK, great. So we actually have um, all the information of an equivalence of categories, except uh, we need a natural isomorphism going in the other direction. Switch cameras for this last part. So I'm not going to use quite this entire board space for this proof, but I'm using most of it. <coughs> Maybe I should leave the definition of an equivalence of categories up. annoying when people do this in the middle of proofs. You could, you could consider this lemma part of the proof. All right. So given uh, f from c to d uh, is a fully faithful functor, so f dot f people write for fully faithful, or at least lazy people like me write it for fully faithful. Um, if uh, f applied to some map, sorry, this goes from f of x, f of y is an iso in D, then f is an iso in C. Uh, so it reflects isomorphisms. The, the functor f reflects isomorphisms, we would say. All right. So this is this is short uh, proof. Okay. So we have um, f f inverse from f of y to f of x because f of x is an isomorphism, so we have an inverse morphism. Um, as f is fully faithful, uh, there exists a unique map, g, from y to x, such that f of g uh, equals this inverse of f. Um, then, what do we have? We have that f applied to g composed with f is f of g, f of x. But f of g is the inverse of f of f. So that's the identity on f of x. Um, but. Uh, by faithfulness, but here we just need that it's faithful. Um, then g of f is equal to the identity on x, right? Because f also sends the identity on x to the identity on f of x. But faithfulness tells me that that map is injective. So if I have f sending this to the identity on f of x, and f sending the identity on x to the identity on f of x, then these maps have to be the same map. Um, and similarly, uh, f of f of g is f of f, f of g, which is the identity on f of 
y. So f g is getting kind of low. Um, so f of g, uh, f composed of g, is the identity on y by the same argument. All right. Box around this. Great. All right, now let's get back to what we were actually trying to do. Um, so the last thing I need to do is build the um, natural isomorphism in the other direction. Okay, I'm seeing some concerned faces. How do people feel about this? What I just did. Is anyone stuck on any of, any of that? No? Okay. So, uh, we're going to construct this epsilon in the other direction. So let, oh wait, do we have epsilon? Sorry, we're going to construct eta in the other direction. So let, um, oh, let's say consider. Consider is a better word here. Consider. inverse morphism for the component f of x. What does this go from? Well, it goes from f of x to f of g applied to f of x. And this is an isomorphism um, as f is fully faithful. Uh, there exists a unique map a to x, which goes from x to g f of x, and f of a to x equals epsilon of x, the inverse of epsilon f of x. OK, so I'm using fully faithfulness to say that there is a, a map of this form that goes back to here. All right. Now, for some map f from x to y in C, we consider the following diagram. f of x going to f of g of f of x going to f of x. And we have f of y y going to f of y. All right. So here, we're going to take the um, a to x, uh, f applied to a to x, right? which is, in fact, this inverse map that we started with. So this is an isomorphism. And here, we'll do the same thing. We have f of a to y. Uh, going in this direction, um, now we have eta of f of x, because eta goes from f of g applied to something to that something. So f of g applied to f of x goes to f of x. Uh, and similarly here, we have eta f of y. And here we have f applied to f, f applied to f, and f, g, f, apply to f. OK, these are also isomorphisms. OK, so uh, I'm going to say this is 1. So 1. Commutes as eta is a natural transformation. So this is a naturality square for eta. All right. Sorry, epsilon, thank you. Um, <coughs> and 
the outside rectangle. Uh, commutes as um, well because this composition is the identity on f of x and this composition is the identity on f of y right because this is actually the inverse of that map and this is actually the inverse of that map because that's how we define a to x um, so uh, just just for some more practice of like doing the equations sort of diagram chasing things I'm just going to write out um, so what I want to say is that going this way is the same as going this way so I want to say that um, f of f composed with eta f of x composed with um, f of eta x. So now I'm doing this bit first. This is equal to um, f of f composed with the identity on f of x, which is f of f, which is the identity on f of y composed with f of f, which is um, epsilon f of y composed with f of theta y composed with f of f. OK, and that's the thing that says that this outside rectangle commutes. OK. So we know that this rectangle commute, this square commutes, and the outside rectangle commutes. And the thing that I want really is that this commutes. Um, <coughs> so I want to show that the square two commutes. Two commutes by. All right. So I'm going to start by doing this bit. This, this top bit. So it's f g of f of f composed with f of theta x. Um, but this square commutes, and this is an isomorphism. So this is equal to, uh, let's see epsilon f of y inverse composed with f of f composed with epsilon f of x composed with f of eta x. Great. So that's, I'm saying that going this way is the same as going this way. But now I've got this identity here. Uh, so then this is epsilon f of y inverse composed with f of f composed with the identity on f of x. So this is epsilon f of y inverse composed with f of f. But epsilon f of f, f of y inverse is f applied to a to y. So this is f of a to y composed with f of f. But that's precisely what this other side was. And so I've shown that this and this commute. Um, and finally, we're at the end. And annoyingly, I have not left myself enough room. Um, so I'm going to erase this first part of the proof. Uh, But we're like really right at the end now. Um, uh, so um, uh, by faithfulness, OK, this square just has f applied to everything. 
So because of faithfulness, I can just take the f out, and the square still commutes. So the map x from gf to x, y, to gf of y, and here I have f, and here I have gf of f, and here I have a to x, and here I have a to y, commutes. Um, and and uh, so eta from the identity on C on C. I think so. Yeah. To G F is a natural transformation, and by the lemma, uh, eta x is an ISO for all x in C. So um, eta is a natural isomorphism. Uh, because the image of eta x under a fully faithful functor is an isomorphism. So eta x is an isomorphism. And so now we have all of the information, and we have shown that we have an equivalence of categories. And so now, I haven't been doing this, but now I'm going to put a tombstone, because I feel like we really earned it today. Um, all right. And now, I have a little bit more to say. Um, the, uh, so I said I wouldn't show you um, an example of an equivalence of categories until we had this recognition theorem, because it makes showing that something is an equivalence of categories much easier. You don't actually have to exhibit all of this information. You just have to exhibit a functor that's fully faithful and essentially subjective on objects. Um, so I'll leave up the theorem, and I'll Sets. Uh, very good job of raising F from N to N with uh, N being the set of natural numbers up to and including N. Okay, and this is going to be a so a morphism from M to N will be a function of this type. And C is equivalent to the whole category of finite sets um, so actually maybe 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 to be lazier I'm going to say that the objects are sets. And so um, a morphism is literally just a function between these sets. Uh, this, is this category is equivalent to finite sets via the inclusion functor. Functor. do? Well, it takes the set to itself and a function in the set to that same function. All right. Uh, so every function between two sets of this type is a function between two sets of this type. Uh, and so the, this inclusion function is full. 
Um, it's faithful because if you have two different functions between two of these sets, then it's two different functions between two of these sets. Uh, and it's essentially surjective on object because every finite set is isomorphic to one of these, whichever one has the same cardinality as it. <coughs> Ah, sorry, thank you. Yes. Finite set. All right. Yes. The finite, the empty set. What are you talking about? So I mean, like you include n. Ah, okay. Yes. I'll, 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 I'll. Thank you. I'll include the empty set. Great. Um. All right. So. I want to note something here, which is that C is small. There is a countable number of objects in C. The category of finite sets is not small. Uh, there is a class of objects in the category of finite sets. Uh, and in particular, this means that smallness as a notion is not equivalence invariant. So you, um, and what that means is that smallness is evil. So if a notion is not invariant under equivalence, then it's a bad notion. Um, it's evil. This is, this, is a, this is a category theory thing. Uh, there's some some people would like argue about whether or not evil is like a well-defined concept. Um, it's uh, I want to say you know it when you see it. Um, but so instead, I want black. Instead, we say a category is essentially small. if it is equivalent to a small category. And now this concept, is, this definition is not evil. OK. Uh, so one thing I should say is that equivalence of categories is an equivalence relation in that it is reflexive, transitive, and symmetric. All right. Uh, this notion of equivalence is the good notion of equivalence. And in fact, the theorem about um, this theorem sort of tells you why it's the good notion of equivalence. The point is that um, categorically, we only care about how an object relates to every other object in the category. And so, and we've seen before that if two, category, if two objects are isomorphous, isomorphic, then the category doesn't really distinguish them. Um, because maps into them have a well-defined bijection after you pick an isomorphism. And similarly, map, maps out of them have a well-defined bijection um, the same way. Um, so what you're saying is that all I care about is that like there's something that looks like, like something in the image of my functor um, that sort of has the same relations as every other object in that cat in the category, the target category. Um, um, that's a reasonable thing to say. Yes. Um, so what have I written here? Essentially, subjective ensures that every object's relations are captured by something in the target category. And fully faithful ensures that those relations are the same in the target category as they were in the source category. Um, OK. So that's why that's the good notion of equivalence. Um, and I wanted to just get like a brief start on 
what I want to talk about next time. Uh, so I, this is the last page of stuff I have to put up. Um, and we get to one of the <coughs> most important and like annoyingly difficult Annoyingly simple but difficult to really like grasp notions in category theory, which is representability. Somehow it's very simple, uh, but understanding the consequences of it are like just constantly surprising and annoying. Um, but cool. So uh, a functor. F from C op to set is representable if uh, there exists some object X and C such that F is isomorphic as a functor to C like x. So we've defined this functor before. This is a functor from also a functor from C up to set, and it takes an object y to the set of maps from y to x in C. So you need a natural isomorphism between these two functors, and if you have one, then we say that f is representable, uh, and f is represented by x. Uh, similarly, for some functor from C into set, um, if F is isomorphic to C X blank. So, like this functor is contravariant, so it, it can be isomorphic to things that are also contravariant, and this functor is covariant, and so it can be isomorphic to things that are also covariant. Um, in the latter case, uh, I put this in orange, so I wanted to write it up, but I don't think I'm going to. In this case. People might say co-representable and co-represented by the object. So we would say that f is co-representable and that it's co-represented by x. Uh, but Emily Real says this is unnecessary as the variance of f should be clear from its definition. Um, I think that's reasonable. Uh, also, I'm not going to argue with Emily Real. Um, so uh, a Representation, representation uh, for f um, is a choice of representing object x and a specified isomorphism. Uh, F, and we'll do the first case here. F, C, I, X. Right, so a representation is a choice of representing object and a choice of natural transformation. And natural isomorphism here, because we can have more than one natural isomorphism here. Um, so I'm going to leave off examples of represent, representation and representability for now, because I just wanted to um, sort of talk about it a little bit, and we'll talk about it more next time. Uh, but now let's see. Maybe I'll put it here. Yeah. All right. Now let's um, see the most, Im the most important theorem in category theory, uh, which is called Yonada's Lemma. Um, 
So, I mean, it's a lemma because it's simple, but you have to remember that theorems get all the credit, lemmas do all the work. Uh, much like the relationship between management and workers. <laughs> all right, so for any functor f from category to a category of sets, uh, and object uh, x and c. So this is the data that we're starting with. There is a bijection from, from dx blank to f and the object or the set f of x. Um, so, is this, right? so this takes, so what's, what's hom from this to this? Well, these are both functors, so it's a natural transformation. So it's, it takes a natural transformation from this functor to f. And it sends it to alpha x applied to the identity on x. Right, so remember that these are, these are both um, functors from C to set. So one of these components goes from this set to this set. But this set contains maps from um, x contains maps from x into some object, but for alpha x, it contains maps from x to itself. And so it has to send the identity to something in f of x. And it sends, um, so this is some element in this set. All right. So we have this bijection, uh, and this Bijection is natural in X and in F. So if I have some function from X to Y, uh, then that induces a map of natural transformations here, and it induces a map of sets here. And you can draw a square, and that square commutes. And similarly, if you have uh, a natural transformation from f to some functor g, you also get uh, a square where you replace, where you have this at the top, and then at the bottom you have g here and g here. And um, that also commutes. All right. So I'm going to email this out. Um, but for next week, uh, so I won't talk again until Monday. So you've got six days. Um, I want, I mean, and I'll email this out. I want people to read the essay. When is one thing equal to some other thing? Uh, by Barry Mazur. It's about 25 pages. It's about representability. It's pretty easy reading. It's not like intense mathematics. It's, um, it's mostly philosophical. Uh, yeah, and that's all I have to say today. Thanks, guys.